Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager, and I get to be your host today. We want to thank our, spans our sponsors today, the Hand Weavers Guild of Nashville. Uh, it's a great job when our guilds step up and help support the textiles and tea and the artists that are on them. We appreciate your sponsorship, Nashville. Uh, we will take questions at the last 15 minutes of each of the session today. Please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. Uh, we uh, can't always see them when they're in the chat, but we love those comments. Keep those coming. But if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. Um, we're having a little technical difficulty, but I'm going to keep going, but we may have to pause a little bit. Um, today, we have Vicki Vipperman. Vicki lives near Nashville, Tennessee. She has been weaving clothing, accessories, and contemporary arts since receiving a BFA at the University of Georgia. Weaving with silk, bamboo, cotton, most of Vicarin's uh, work is functional fabric for clothing accessories. She dyes it using the ECOT technique to create patterns in the unwoven yarn. Occasionally, she strays into wall art, Weaving galleries, um, impressive landscapes, or reweaving texts to explore worldly or spiritual concepts. Vipperman shows her works at art fairs and galleries throughout the Southeast. She's a member of the Southern Highlands Craft Guild, the Piedmont Craftsman Inc., Tennessee Craft, American Craft Council, Handweavers Guild of America, and the Handweavers Guild of Nashville. We are so excited to have her on today, and I'm hoping she's here and she is not. <laughs> so we're having a little trouble getting her on. You know, technology's great until it doesn't work. <laughs> so Vicki is from the Nashville area, and it's kind of interesting because uh, long before we set up Vicki, um, we started doing an article about the professor who ran the arts program at University of Georgia, UGA. So it's interesting that they both happened at the same time. When you get your next um, issue of SS&D, there'll be an article in there about Glenn Kaufman, and that was her professor when, when she was at UGA. So I'm hoping we'll get her back and we can talk some about um, Glenn Kaufman and her experience at the University of Georgia. While we're waiting, I just want to remind everyone, if you have not signed up for Convergence yet, you might want to check into that. And also be sure you look at the spotlights that we're doing. Those have been so much fun. And I have to say, sometimes I see a class and I'm like, eh, maybe I'd take that, maybe I wouldn't. But when I would watch it, I really would get an idea of what the class was about. Hey, Vicki. Okay, you're on mute. You're on mute, sweetie. Okay, is that better? There you go. All right, you've been been introduced. So welcome. <laughs> We've been chatting while you've been gone. I have I'm so gonna, low tech. We're that, gonna that, jump right in here right now, okay? Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> first question, and maybe I should start to the big ones first, so we in case we lose you again. But anyway, your first question is what is your favorite tea? Uh well, I'm a southern girl, so iced tea is what tea is. There and you go. My favorite is um, a blend of blueberry and cherry, and I don't do sweet tea. I like unsweet blueberry and cherry tea, um, but if I do hot tea, I like ginger. Oh, okay, good, good, good. So tell us how you got started in fiber. Um, well, like a lot of people, uh, I, said, I, did, I made stuff. Uh, first... My first dress was made from bed sheet, you know, with the seams on the outside and no no way to get into it. But, you know, you learn as you go. And uh, I became, I, I had access to potholders when I was, you know, a preteen. My father ran a boys club. And so we had an endless supply of loopers. So I made so many potholders that I had to go door to door in our neighborhood and sell them. You could do that back in those days. And when everybody had enough potholders, I would sew them together and make placemats. So I never thought about that as a career, but I kept sewing all the way through high school and uh, college. And in college, I thought I wanted to be a potter because it just sounded good. And I took a couple of years of pottery at a small school and transferred to the University of Georgia, 
where I was not allowed to get my first pottery class with the teacher I wanted. So We've lost her again. Oh, she's back. <laughs> okay. I don't know what this is. Um, hey, Vicki, let's try something. Anyway, and I know it's going to college, University of Georgia, couldn't get a clay class, but there was a room full of looms that looked real interesting. Hey, Vicki. Why don't we do this? Turn okay. your camera off. What, what do we need to try? Turn your camera off. Her camera. Now I can't hear off. you. Oh, it's already oh, off. Oh, man. Her camera is off. This. Um, here, hi, Vicki. I'm going to suggest you do, um, let's, first of all, to our Turn my camera off. Your patience. Okay. Vicki, um, your camera, we're showing that you're not c connected to audio. So we lost her again. So for everybody who's watching, thank you. We did not have this problem before when we worked with her. We don't know what's going on with the internet for Vicki, but we have some workarounds. So if you could be patient, um, we will be patient and we're going to work through this. While we're waiting, I'm going to keep talking about Spotlight. <laughs> Anyway, what I was saying is that if you watch those, you hear the instructor explain about the class and tell a little bit more than what you saw in the blurb. And it gives you a better idea if this is a class that, one, do you want to take? And two, is it appropriate for where you are in your career, in your art world? Uh, or do you want to try something new? And I really encourage you, they're all recorded. You can go watch them anytime you want. Um, and they're um, really a great way to learn more about the teacher and about the class. So I encourage you, and they're recorded, so you can go back and watch them anytime you like. And we've got another, I think, four more that we're going to do live. And so check those out. If you haven't signed up yet for Convergence, or if you're thinking you might want to add something, uh, jump in there and do that if you can. They're really a great way. <clears throat> So it looks like Vicki is signing on now. Okay. Um, we have her on. It does not show an audio connection. Vicki, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. So I am unmuted and video. Your camera is off. And let's you know, just keep it is that off. way. Yes. We are showing your camera is off and that you have um, no audio. So I'm glad that you, we can hear you. Um, but as long as, do you see at the, um, Kathy, if you can handle that question, I'll handle sure, it. I'll do that right now. Vicki, um, Vicky, if you can see on your Zoom on the bottom left-hand corner where it has the mute, there's a little carrot next to that. If you can click on that. Oh, we lost her. Okay, there we go. We've got Vicki back. You're muted, sweetie. Vicki, unmute. Mute. There you okay. go. All right. Okay, it, it unmuted. There's the carrot. All right. You're good. This is why I don't have a computerized loom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally manual. All right. Well, let's just keep going and see what we can get done today, okay? Okay, I'm All right. so sorry. No, uh, not your fault. All right, so you're, you are part of the Southern Highlands Guild, and yes. it is a juried organization. You can't just join it. You have to get juried in. Uh, they right. have a beautiful gallery up near Asheville. Um, so what does it mean for you to be part of that guild and to have gotten juried into it? Well, it was it was a uh, big stepping stone when I first started weaving full time. Um, the the community, you know, the, the mark of excellence, the community of people, um, the economic opportunities, you know, all of those things matter. 
um, but the, the, the human connection has been great. I've made friends for life with other artists while being able to uh, be supported to make a living at a high quality, you know, in a high quality situation. They really are great at supporting artists and helping them um, be viable, right? To yeah. sell what they have. Yeah, well, well the it actually started the, in the history of the, the Guild. It was begun in order to help support the artists of the Appalachian region and help them survive, as well as keep the traditions of the crafts alive. So all that's meaningful to me. Yes. Well, one of your statements underneath your description in the Southern Highlands page, I thought was wonderful. It says, my goal as a weaver is to make what machines cannot, to capture a sense of time and place, color and texture, and create fabric with spirit, heart, and maybe a glimpse of magic. I like that last part. Most of it felt real okay with me. I understood it. I got it. But I wasn't quite sure about the capture a sense of time and place. Would you talk more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, it, it, it sort of applies in multiple ways. Um, the landscapes that I do with the, the ecot and the double ecot, you know, that's actually a place and from a time. Mm -hmm. um, they're usually taken from photo or inspired by photographs I've taken or uh, impressionist paintings, which I love. So there's your time and place. Uh, the wearables, where are you going to wear it? You know, what's going to be special about having this garment on you uh, at any given moment? Um, and then, oops, when you get into the uh, word weavings, which we'll look at later, or some of the wall art, some of the other wall art, uh, I use words with meaning and history, as well as uh, I even use newspapers, which definitely is a sense of time and place when you're reconnecting um, headlines and newspapers and things that have happened in our in our world. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Now this next one is, um, we have an image of uh, a detail of one of your works. And um, how do you design your work? Do you do it with a graph paper, computer? Do you design well, it as you go? Um, I, I'm not computer. <laughs> as evidenced by the technical technology trouble we're having today. Um, I'm, I'm more of a graph paper and then a trial and error and a, a play with things. Um, when I'm doing the wearable work, uh, I look at color combinations from anywhere I can see that that appeal to me. Um, then I can translate those into dye combinations. Um, and that's all. Hey, Vicki, come back. Come on, come back. Oh, you're muted again. Hey, you know what, Vicki, let's try this because we're going to be looking at so many of your images. Why don't you keep your camera off? Because sometimes that helps. Okay. And let's see if that Thank helps. You. And then we can look at your work. That's good. Then you don't have to look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should turn my camera off too. <laughs> no, you look good. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, well, you, you're talking about color and pattern. That was my next question is, what do you think is more important to you? And I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask anyway, what's more important to you, color or pattern? And how did that come about, do you think? Well, c color and pattern, and then there's structure. And mm -hmm. they all kind of build on each other because um, it was structure that hooked me first. The magic of seeing these threads become something unique and solid and whole and usable. Um, in fact, when I first started weaving, everything was white or brown or, you know, it was very muted. And then color sort of came into it. But I like color that you can't take out of the fabric. I'm not interested in printing on somebody else's fabric. I see. Okay. I want it to be the, the technique that I use with the painted warps the color and the patterning is inherent in the structure of the weaving. So you can't take it out. 
and something about that combination um it evolved but it when i look back and try to put it into words it it intrigues me i can't have well, one without the other well i would have never thought your earlier works would have been white and neutrals <laughs> oh it was you, the 70s, your 70s. color is so wonderful <laughs> it's just amazing Oh, well, it, I, I love it now. Um, but I, it was, you know, it was an evolution. I was, it, I was leaving in the seventies. We did the bog jackets and the, the natural everythings and, uh, or neutral everythings. And now I force myself once in a while to do that just, you know, for variety. And I still do. Um, I don't think we have a picture of it, but I do some all silk and all bamboo pieces that are hook laces that are made just to be structural patterns and I do like that um and I do them in black and white and that's sort of the alter ego from the wild colors oh, that okay I'm attracted to <laughs> <laughs> well you didn't get to really finish your talk about um UGA so I want to go back to that because I, I was telling people that we're getting, getting ready to do an article about Glenn Kaufman, who right. is at the University of Georgia. And can you talk a little bit more about, because it sounds like you were going to be a potter. Yeah, I was going to be a potter. And it's Glenn Kaufman's fault that I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I saw that room full of looms and I thought they looked intriguing. And so I signed up for Fiber 101, which turned out to be all handwork. At the very end, we built a little frame loom and, and did some, you know, tapestry weeding on it. But I didn't get to use the, the floor looms. So I had to sign up for the second class. And, and to, oh, to back up, Glenn Kaufman actually taught that first class. It wasn't a student intern or anything. He taught wow. that one class. And he was so fascinating and such a, a joy to be around. And then so... It, the combination of that and the fact that I was jonesing to get on the looms, um, I had to take the second one. Then after that, it was just, I was on the road to where I am now. <laughs> and I like, it, I like that. I was jonesing to get on those looms. <laughs> I, I was, I was. I'm going to add that to my, my list of this could be a good t-shirt saying, I'm jonesing <laughs> to get on the loom. I like that. Well, where did the... Then did you just walk away from pottery and you just stayed with fiber? Pretty much. Um, when I graduate, when I got my undergraduate degree in fiber, I went, I stayed in Athens and I went to the community, one of the community centers and I signed up for one class in pottery just to see. And I think I finished that class, but I, I'm not even sure. I just started saving money for my loom. And I had already been saving money for the loom. So I put all the money toward that and bought my first loom, which was a 60 inch 12 harness of Claire as a recent graduate in a rental property. So picture that <laughs> you had to walk around it to get, you know, from the front door to the kitchen. Did you say 12 uh, shafts? 12 shafts. Wow. That is a big loom for a beginner. Yeah. But I, I didn't I didn't know what I wanted to do and I didn't want to be limited. And I had done a little bit of wall work. Um, in fact, I'd done more wall work in at the university because it was mm -hmm. it was one of those environments where it was an art school. You know, we were looking to make an impact and, and to do things um, not so much wearables and not so much how to um, at art fairs. Art fairs were still a novelty sort of in those days, which is how really? I've been making my living. But I came in, we came into class one Monday morning and one of our fellow students said that they had done an art fair that weekend. And we all said, what is that? She said, well, we went to the park and we put a tablecloth on a picnic table and we put stuff out and people came and bought it. And I think the ACC shows had already started at that point, but it was a new concept to us because at school, it was you were either studying to go into industry or education. Mm -hmm. And that sort of piqued my interest because it was just doing it and having control over what you wanted to do. So the big loom, I just... I thought I might want to work big and I tried it for a while and I just kept getting a little smaller and a little smaller. <laughs> and, uh, but I used to make little eight inch scarves on that 60 inch loom if I needed to. 
But well, this next image we're going to show is a piece made with your econ. It is just gorgeous. Um, so would you give a brief description of the technique so people will know um, what was involved in making this color gradation? And, okay. and then what was the appeal of, of this kind of weaving? Um, well, the appeal is I, I like function. And I had sewn my way through college, but I quit sewing when I started weaving. And then I finally got the nerve to cut fabric and weave clothing, and it kind of finally merged that. But as far as the technique of the first, the question, the first question was about the technique. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Can you explain how you got that color? Yeah. Um, what I, I work off of 36, well, 12 yard warps is my standard. And I lay them all out on a table on my back porch, which is 36 feet long. <laughs> and I paint a two foot repeat. So this is a gradient of rainbow colors uh, that repeats every two feet. And now, of course, it doesn't repeat exactly because you've got the stretch and blend that happens when you put this yarn on the loom, uh, which is what I love. Um, if I wanted to make straight stripes, I would use a totally different technique. But I'm fascinated by the yarns shifting and blending mm -hmm. um, and that color fade from one to the next. So um, this piece was obviously a rainbow. <laughs> And I have different color combinations, but I stay with that two foot repeat because I know within my sewing, my garment designs, roughly where those colors will fall and how to get some semblance of chaotic control. It's kind of like controlled chaos. <laughs> I like that. I like controlled chaos better than chaotic control. <laughs> Oh, that is so funny. I love and, that. And another element that um, plays into this is that I'm blending yarns. So when I'm dyeing the yarn, I may be doing a bamboo and a silk or a cotton and a silk, and they'll each take the dye a little differently. Oh, so right. in that color area, you've got more shading than just the blending. Now, in this last piece, do you remember what that was? What that the was a, a vest. No, I mean the material. Was it cotton? Oh, um, that tin one was, silk? Well, it was probably cotton and silk. It mm. may have had some bamboo in it. And then you put in the, the black stripes, right? Yeah. Yeah. I blend the um the hand dyed yarns. Oh my goodness. Don't do that. Um I blend the hand dyed yarns with solid colors. So I'm using a solid color weft and some solid warp to help expand the um the color palette well let, let's talk some more about your dyeing uh, this next image will show the beautiful colors as you're dyeing them those are gorgeous and so do you dye all of the yarn that you use do you always just get it white and start dyeing or do you kind of do a combination well, for all the painted warp stuff, but when it comes to the solid colors that I blend into it and what I use for the weft, mm -hmm. um, those are purchased in colors. They're, they're already dyed. So if I had to dye it all, I, it would just, I, I wouldn't have time. <laughs> There's not <laughs> enough hours in the day. So I work with um, what's available in terms of the solids. I have dyed some things solid and some solid yarns, but as a general rule, I don't. Now, did you learn this technique in college or is this something you picked up afterwards? In a way, um, we did some things that, but they were more of a ecot, the, the old ecot where you bind and dye and dip dye things. What I'm doing is a more direct application because I'm painting directly onto the yarn. And to be honest, um, thanks to the Hand Weaver Guild of Nashville, I went to a, a one day workshop that did painted warp. And I mean, we were in uh, Nancy Granner's basement and there were warps tied to chairs and tables and, and just all over the place. But it turned something on in me because I didn't have to do that big pot of dye and pull out and pull out and pull out and then um, rewrap to get another color combination. I could just put all those colors where I want them. And uh, that that felt like it opened up a lot of possibilities to me. 
Now, I know someone's going to ask, what kind of dye do you use? Uh, Procyon MX. Okay. Because it's made for the um, the pro, uh, the cellulose fibers. And it the silk takes it as well, but it takes it differently. So it gives mm -hmm. a different tone. Um, I even have a booth, uh, a sign in my booth for art fairs that says uh, bamboo, silk, cotton, hemp, no wool, because wool takes a whole nother chemical mm -hmm. you know, composition. So, uh, And wool's not real popular in the South. Okay, well, be, uh, we're in the South, you know, we don't need it for warmth so much. We have moths, which are very <laughs> distressing. Yes. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things I couldn't take with pottery was you could drop it and break it. You know, I don't want to weave something beautiful and then have a moth eat it. So, and we don't need it. You know, these fibers, they work together well. They wash together well. I, I machine wash everything I weave, uh, or at least 99% of what I weave. Um, and you can wear it year round in air conditioning in the summer. You wear it with layers in the winter. So it it just um, suits suits the Southern in me. If you wear it in the South, you can wear it anywhere. True. True. Now, this next image is of a um, art project that you did, I believe, in an elementary school. Yes. Uh huh. This was so. How? Fun. Tell us about this project. How did it come about? How did you get involved in it? Well, this goes back to the idea that weaving connects us. Um, there, there's so many metaphor, you know, the metaphor of weaving mm -hmm. for taking separate things and pulling them together into some new, wonderful, uh, unimaginable thing that a machine wouldn't do. A machine would do the same thing over and over and over again. This mm -hmm. will never be repeated uh, the same way again. This particular piece, I believe, ended up being around 18 feet long, maybe maybe 20 wow. feet long. Um and it was done at an elementary school and we had it set up so that every student, every teacher, every faculty and staff had the opportunity to weave on the floor loom. And they were asked to bring in fabric that was of some sort of meaning to them. Oh, um, I had backups if somebody didn't have that, but people brought in things like their favorite pillowcase or their grandma's curtains or I mean, we've had everything from neonatal blankets to um, somebody's mother's wedding, part of somebody's mother's wedding dress. And uh, we cut those into strips. And then each student was a, or faculty, whatever, was able to weave that into this community fabric that would unite them for all. You can't take one out. Um, it's that same sort of idea with the ECOT work. The, the color is there. You can't remove it. It's not mm -hmm. a separate entity. Um, and the older, the older students and the faculty also had the opportunity to write on that fabric. If there was a name or a dream or a, a you know, a memorial, whatever, um, they could do that. And once, once that gets into the weaving, it gets all smushed, but it's still in there. So there's that inherent heart that just, spreads through the whole weaving. And in this particular project, we were able to take the words that we asked each student to describe why the fabric was important to them. And we boiled it down to a sentence. And so each of those um, blocks represents one of the classrooms, one of the students and oh. teachers in that classroom and what the meaning of their fabric was. And you can't, it's not from start to finish in the actual weaving because the way schools are scheduled, you don't get to just, you know, line everybody up and go until it's done. So we were back and forth and back and forth, but they each had their classroom um, reference as well. So it gives people some idea of the heart and meaning in that's, you know, inherent in the weaving itself. Now, are the little blue tabs divide the classroom no that was the the initial idea was that they would uh -huh. because we couldn't get through a whole classroom at one time so art art classes range from 30 minutes to 40 50 minutes um so you didn't we couldn't get every student in 
from each class and do it sequentially. So we marked every foot with the blue marker and we kept a journal that of who wove when in each of those sections, section one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And that way the student, it became very apparent that it was gonna be important for the student to be able to find their fabric. And when it's 18, 20 feet long, that can get kind of dicey. So we had that extra reference to say, well, you're in section eight. And then they could go between those two markers and generally all, everybody always found their fabric. That's so nice. How did you get involved in this? Did somebody approach you? Did you approach them? Um, it, it, well, it started way back at a church that I belong to, uh, West End Methodist Church in Nashville. And mm -hmm. we were trying to do something new. And I had seen the concept of community weaving, as I call it, um, done there. So we did a, an altar cloth and like for four Sundays, I had the loom set up and people would do the same thing, bring something that mattered to them or take a, a, a fabric strip from the basket and write on it. So we made a smaller altar cloth. Then I was taking a workshop with um, actually David, uh, da, well, da, David, David, help me, Elaine. Eustace? Houston, yes. <laughs> I was taking a uh, workshop with David Houston on indigo dyeing. And this lovely woman in there, um, Libby Scanlon, an elementary school teacher, we got to talking and her school actually had a floor loom. And she had never known what to do with it. She said, what could we do? And we just kind of brainstormed and talked about it. Is that and her in the picture? That's, this is actually the second one I did. Um, oh, okay. This is not Libby, uh, um, but Libby's fabulous too. And, and it, her the weaving we did there was just to die for. Um, and so she's the one that got me started. And then she knew this teacher and another one. So I've done three in the schools around Nashville so far. And each of them were, the art teachers all know each other. So they were all friends of, of each other. Um, well, it's beautiful. Um, I love the little squares underneath it. That's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, in Libby's, in the first one, she had a, a connection with a framer who actually did four long, narrow, you know, uh, wide horizontal pieces. And each one of those had the blocks in them. We didn't have that um, resource with um, this teacher. And I'm, I'm so embarrassed that I can't think of her name, but um, she was fabulous. Uh, so we came up with doing just the individual blocks and I've done them. And the third one, we didn't do the blocks because the school was so much larger mm. and it just, um, it got to be too much. So we just did the fabric itself. And I'm working now on some ideas for ways to do in not necessarily the one long fabric, but maybe do it in components so mm. that it could be a little more flexible, even though my heart is in the idea that it's all one big thing and you can't separate it well your your weaving is very um eclectic diversified i'm not sure what the word is but this well, next I, image we, we've used some other words that are probably not appropriate as far as being a um, split personality Stop but Stop that this next image shows a couple of your pieces and i wanted to put them side by side just to show how skillful you are and like on the left, you have this gorgeous scarf. So you you wear, I mean, you weave a lot of um, clothing, wearables, that kind of thing. But then on the right, you have this beautiful wall hanging. So do you prefer one over the other? How do you find, are you in a mood that you want to do a wall hanging or is it? I get a bee in my bonnet about an idea. <laughs> um, I, I I wouldn't want to do just the wall work. I try at first, I, when I first started weaving, that was what my aim was, was to do things for the wall. But I kept getting drawn back into the texture and the drape and the feel of mm -hmm. things um, in, in wearables. But then I would still get, the bug would still bite me about different things. And the first one that I ever did that I called a word weaving was called a month of Sundays. And it was the headlines from the Sunday Tennessean for 31 consecutive weeks. So that was the really? month of Sundays. And that kind of started, well, I say that was the first one. It actually wasn't, but there was a little test one before that. Mm -hmm. um, 
but then it evolved from the newspaper headlines into other words of meaning. And I don't use my words. It, it Somehow, I, I'm not inclined to do that. I'm using the words that exist and taking them apart and putting them back together, weaving them back together um, to be something, some kind of new uh, impact. So this piece is called A Vision of Faith. And it's the center part is woven from the text from seven different spiritual faiths. And I wrote them down because every time I try to name them, I leave one out. But it's got Christian, Hebrew, Taoist, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, and Native American writings in it. And, and Mandy, if we can't, there you go. Let's go ahead and go to the next one so you can see it closer. Yeah. Because this is fascinating how you did this. And so then they were all... Um, cut into, you know, copied and cut into pieces or copied onto um, index weight paper and then cut into strips and rewoven with natural, this one is all natural yarns. Um, and then the outer rim, the words are peace, love, and laughter in multiple languages. So the peace is the circle, the love is the heart, and the square is the laughter and the, the center of the square that that cutout is actually a mirror and that's to remind you to laugh at yourself oh this is wonderful so and then the fat the fibers were uh color cottons you know that are grown in the colors as well as the blue was a recycled denim that i was able to get for a very short period of time and have not been able to get my hands on much of it since <laughs> So is the denim that it looks gray on my computer screen? Yeah, is the, that the, square in the center. The square in the center surrounding okay. the, the big circle is actually a recycled denim. Okay, all right. But it's hand hand woven. I mean, I wove it from recycled denim yarn. Now and was this for us on the on the um on the bigger picture? You can't tell it in the the close up but on the bigger picture you can almost see that those yarns were natural dyes on cotton from college they go all the way back to Glenn Kaufman era <laughs> really and that I had had around and they have faded dramatically because I guess we didn't mordant write or whatever but um that was the the rain that was to give it the rainbow effect so that the rainbow spread over all the words and the other part of using those seven texts together is that they basically they're saying the same thing they're the heart of different cultures but it's the same heart so mm -hmm. that's kind of where i get all talky about stuff instead of just <laughs> weaving and Okay. wearing things well was this just your idea did it come to you for an exhibit just something you wanted to make or was this for something in particular well it actually started I had said that my first big piece was the month of Sundays um but what started it was the Southern Highlands Guild has a member mm -hmm. show every so often and the theme of this member show was black and white and I had, um, I wove a black shawl and a white shawl and I thought that'll be, you know, really cool. But I just wasn't excited about it. And to me, growing up in our era, black and white was the newspaper. You know, mm -hmm. what's black and white and red all over? Well, <laughs> the newspaper. So I took a Sunday newspaper. No, I think the first one was actually a Saturday newspaper. And I cut out the headlines and I literally wove the headlines together on the newsprint with yarn and framed it really crazy in um what do you call them baking pans on a old leftover board and sent it off to this exhibit and when it came back the last word the last word on the bottom line was go nuke and nuke was torn off. The UKE was torn off. And from that moment on, I said, no, you got to print it onto something heavier, oh. more permanent. And so through the years, I've laminated them. And that 
has its own inherent problems. Um, so usually I mod podge or do something to um, help preserve the paper. But I've done a lot of them where I didn't coat, coat them with anything and they've held up really well. So that's been a testament to um, index weight paper. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea of in black and white is what, what started it. And mm -hmm. then I just kind of kept going from there. In fact, I did one that's in the uh, the Tennessee State Museum has a piece that was woven from the headlines when Nashville had its big flood back in 2010. Uh, it started on May 1st and I was displaced. Everybody was just, you know, a mess. But when I was finally able to get back to my home a week later, all of a sudden, all of my newspapers that would have come during that period of time were delivered together. And that was meaningful to me that the, the, the mail made sure the, the newspaper mm -hmm. people made sure that I had all of those. So I had to use them, you know, and so I did the 31 days of each day throughout the flood. And it was really inspiring to see what people did and how they rallied together. And um, so I, it just, each one kind of has its own story, sense of place and time. <laughs> there you go. There you mm -hmm. go. <laughs> well, um, what's next for you? What do you What do you go up to now? Well, some of the same. <laughs> um, I'm doing fewer art fairs. I've I've keep been telling myself for several years to not do outdoor fairs because of the wear and tear on my body and the yeah. tent, and it just gets harder and harder. And a beautiful day in the park is wonderful, but you'd be surprised how few of them are beautiful and how many of them are dirty and dusty or wet and muddy and rainy and stormy and et cetera. So I'm doing some indoor fairs. Um, I have work at Shamai Gallery in Nashville, which has been, a, um, I've had a relationship with since, almost since they opened. And I'm fixing to, um, I'm working on another relationship now with a gallery in Santa Fe called the Santa Fe Weaving, Santa Fe Weaving Gallery. So that's new for me. Um, I want to do some more exploration of the community weaving. Um, I want to do another series of landscapes because I haven't done many of those in a while. And I want to keep weaving clothing. I, it, it's never boring to me. Um, every step of the process still excites me. So um, I, I, I can't help but I mean, I'm, I've hit 70 and people float the retirement word around and I just kind of go, well, there was this fabulous clay artist in Nashville named Sylvia Hyman, and she was in her 90s, I believe, when she said this. Um, she was interviewed, and they asked her if she was ever going to retire and, and quit work. And she said, well, yeah, I'll quit when I run out of ideas. And she had this beautiful pause and then said, but I have a lot of ideas. And that's kind of how I feel. Um, I'll quit when I run out of steam, but I've got a backlog <laughs> still waiting that I want to do. Well, um, let's check some questions. How's that? Sounds good to me. All right. We've got Anne Marie Mullen. You may know her. Says, hi, Vicki. So proud of you and your beautiful work. What yeah. size yarn do you use? And thank you from a Hand Weavers Guild of Nashville. <laughs> um I'll, the majority of my work is the five twos uh -huh. both cotton and um bamboo and the silk is i don't know how to it, it's a 30s too mm -hmm. silk is a 30s too usually sometimes it's bigger <laughs> um gene vogel says i miss seeing you on the art fair circuit i have a couple of technical questions uh she want to know what weight you're using. You've already answered that. And how long do you keep your painted wart chemically active before rinsing? Um, I, I do a, um, what do you, they call it? Humidity set. Uh -huh. So I paint on, on plastic and then I cover it in plastic. <laughs> and I've always heard 12, uh, 24 hours, but sometimes I go longer, um, especially, well, especially if I'm busy and can't get back to it. <laughs> so it batches on the table. Um, but anywhere between a, a day, I usually go at least two days. Oh, okay. 
but when I lay out a table, I'm usually, I used to do eight warps at a time. Now I'm trying to be a little more kind to my body and I do four or maybe six at the most. Wow. Um, somebody was asking, Debbie Stringer wants to know about the classroom projects. She wanted to know, are those permanent installations at the school? Yes. Oh, good. Yes, they are. That's good. Um, I wanted to talk some about your um, landscapes. Mandy, can you bring up the landscape from um, back at the beginning? Sure. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about how you make that land? How do you do this? <laughs> um, it's a little crazy, but it's, it's actually would be considered a double ecot um, because I'm painting on this, the warp and the weft. Okay. So the warp is laid out on my big table, but with much more care. It's it's grouped in smaller groups and, and laid out very carefully in order. And then I have grid boards uh, the size of the weft, the width of the weft and and the length of you know of the that the weaving is going to be and I actually lay them out mm -hmm. with brads on the side in the same order at the same scale that they're going to be and then I use two separate images to dye paint from and those then merge when the weaving is done hmm. so does that make sense <laughs> it's amazing so yeah, do you have that, to do you have to do anything different when you're doing a landscape versus um, making yardage for clothing? Yeah, it's it's much more controlled in terms right. of um, where the the colors are going to lay and which colors I want to flow vertically versus which colors I want to flow horizontally. Um, and I have actually done it so that. Sometimes one time I got it, it can get too controlled mm -hmm. and that's pretty weird to say in this kind of a process because it's you know control 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 and then you turn it loose and let it do what it's going to do and and that's what I love about it too because it gives that blending that doesn't happen if you get it too static um now how big is this piece that one is what is it maybe 20 by 36 something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm so sorry we're having technical issues because this is behind you where you're sitting, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I am too. I, you know. <laughs> well, someone was asking, um this is from Tristan. She said, "Are the warps stretched while you paint the dye? And when and how tense do you keep it?" Do you just lay it out or do you put tension it's a good on question. it? With the clothing, it's it's pretty much laid out. I mean, I'll weight one end of it as I'm pulling out the yarn mm -hmm. down the length of the table. But when I'm doing the um, uh, something like a landscape, I'll weight it uh, with bricks or, you know, some kind of weights at each end on top of it. So, you know, it's not stretched exactly right, but it's kind of there. Uh -huh. And then I'll I actually use excess before and after I'll paint a line so that it helps me visually align things when I get to the loom. Um, if that makes sense, it's just another another marker that helps me keep the uh, the stretch. It's there, but it's not. I don't. If something gets pulled, for instance, if a thread got pulled in in the processing I would be able to see that there's that little black mark that should be in line with all these other little black marks right well that, Tristan also had another good question I never thought about this but do you go dark to light or light to dark or does it matter oh it matters um okay. this, it's like um it's well I mean it matters in the sense that you can't paint light over dark right it's like watercolors in a sense so you once do the light the colors, first? What's, once the color's there, it's there. Yeah, so I tend to, um, but I, that being said, I do tend to, I hadn't thought about it, uh, start with my dark colors and then maybe work light and then then go in between to make them meet. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question because I do... It, it, you you can't layer the colors. 
So you just have to lay it out. And I do tend to go from, I start with that dark because that gives me my marker place. And then I'll fade down from there um, in most cases. I mean, everything has an exception and I am not fun to be around while I'm doing this because you just gotta, <laughs> you gotta stay focused and you keep looking and look up and you look up at your image and you look down at your, you know, yarn and, uh, and you know that you just got to trust your, that, that you mixed your colors right and that you've got the ones you want. And if you don't, you go remix a little bit, but try not to get lost because it doesn't look like this on the table. Right, right, right. Uh, d d light can look like dark on the table. Mm -hmm. um, so you just have to trust your your process and your imaging. Um, Marcy Petrini wants to know how large is the fabric that each student or faculty member wove for the community weaving? That's a good question. Oh, yeah. Hey, Marcy. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, well, and Marcy, you're not getting to see her today. <laughs> I know, <laughs> and I'm not getting to see her either, but uh, at least we're on the same link. Um, so the fa the fabric strips, they would generally be an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half, depending on what they were made of. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes we would get something that was upholstery fabric and cut it slightly narrower. Oh, okay. It was crinoline from somebody's tutu you know, you did it wider, but generally that inch to an inch and a half, inch and a quarter um, range. And part of that's determined too by how big it's going to end up being because the wider the fabric, the the bigger it weaves up. So we had, right, to limit, right. we had to limit that to some extent. And then lengthwise on each of those, um, it could vary because it could be a handkerchief that we cut a fun, you know, a way to try to stretch it out, or it might be overlaying several small strips to allow the the person to have enough experience at weaving and enough visual experience that they could see that they had, you know, actually put something in there. Oh, so okay. something really light might be two passes. I like to let them do at least both treadles if possible. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, at least two picks. At least two picks, yeah. Okay. But well, time, I, time and length can, can factor into everything. <laughs> Claudia Vega has a good question. Has any of those students who participate in the school project become textile professionals? Do you know? Well, not yet. <laughs> that you know of. That you know as, of. as far as I know, most of them were between kindergarten and third grade or fourth grade oh <laughs> so and these have all been in the last let's see in the last eight years so they're not quite there yet yeah some of them well one of them you know the l the oldest from the first one could possibly be getting out of high school <laughs> there you go um somebody wants to know what is she said windex white paper but it's index card paper right index, index, stuff. index weight yeah. Paper. yeah, like an index card, but bigger. Yeah, but okay. you can buy it in bigger. And some people call it card stock is another word for it. But there you, you can go. buy it in the, you know, regular size, eight and a half by 11. And I just use my own printer, you know, to print things. And then um, somebody wants to know about um, the the wall hanging with the words. How big was that? I should have asked that when we were looking. Oh, at it's, it. uh, that one's 36 by 36. Oh, okay. 36 think. inches by 36 yeah. inches. It's either that or it's 48 by 48. It's one okay. of those two. <laughs> Roughly in that. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we have to stop for the day. Are we there? We were done. You've answered all questions there are to be asked. <laughs> okay. Well, good. good Thank luck. you so much for being on here, Vicki. You're a trooper. You hung in there <laughs> even through I apologize times. For technology, but like I say, that's why I, that's why I don't have an AVL. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, if you want to see more about Vicki or actually see her, maybe you can see it's at Vicki Vipperman Weaving Studio.com. Uh, there's more information about her projects. A lot of interest about the school project. You may get people contacting you, seeing if they can start that too. Well, that um, but check out our website. I'm sure she'll be glad to help you with that. Um, 
Can we I want to thank our sponsor again today, Handweavers Guild of Nashville. Um, they have a jewel member there in, in Vicki. I'm glad that uh, they were sponsoring her today. That was really nice of you, Nashville. Thank you so much. Well, and I wanted to thank you and uh, Mandy and also the Weavers Guild, you know, for the opportunity and give a little shout out to the Tennessee Craft and uh, Southern Highlands Guilds because they've all been supportive and they're the reason I've managed to do this as long as I have. And we thank them too, because without them, we may not have seen your work today. So thank <laughs> you all for doing that. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> um, Giving Tuesday is coming. So keep in mind from two points of view, one, that when you get ready to do your holiday shopping, think about buying locally, like from Vicki and other uh, artists locally. Think about who would you like to give a gift to that's not from the big box stores and start, try to support some of your local artists or just your local businesses. And then also we have Giving Tuesday, which is the last Tuesday in November. And think about who would you like to support during that giving time? Would it be your local guild? Would it be the Handweavers Guild of America? So it's the end of the year and people are starting to think about where do they wanna donate their money and what organizations do you wanna support? We would love it if you would uh, support HGA at that time of year. So Giving Tuesday, last, last Tuesday in November. We also um, have, we wanna thank those who are already donated to us. We appreciate that because those donations support things like Textiles and Tea, Careers in Textiles, Spinning Weaving Week. All these programs are supported through the donations to the Fiber Trust and to HGA, and we do appreciate that. If you wanna join or donate, please go to our website at weavespindie.org. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, if you missed this part of this program or you wanna share it with someone or you wanna see older programs, please do so. You can do that on the, at the HGA Facebook page or you can go to the YouTube site and see them. And I encourage you, if you do like the YouTube, sign up because when we upload another episode, you'll get a notice saying it's been uploaded. So we appreciate that. Um, we are very excited because next week we have Margaret Roach Wheeler and she's going to be on talking about her incredible work. So wonder, I hope you all have a wonderful week and we will see you next Tuesday. Happy tea. Hi.